Hello, dear Dutch. Welcome to Championship Sunday on the Irish NFL show. It seems like five minutes ago we were sitting previewing the Jags against the Pistons Steelers and we get or something. So I can't believe we're here. Uh, welcome in the column, Brian and Mark. Uh, huge day, boys. Welcome in. Yeah, big, uh, big day, and uh, it seems we have um, snow across much of uh, the island for uh, Championship Sunday, which uh, kind of fitting in that. That very fitting. Welcome in, Brian. How are you? Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, certainly, think we've got to the stage where we can safely say the best four teams by and large have made the uh, championship two games and two great games to uh, to look forward to tonight. Yeah, the snow here as well, but uh, certainly snow in Lambo tonight. So free and to see how Brady and Co. deal with those adverse weather conditions. Yeah, it's snowing like Christmas Day here, Mark in Tyrone here. Really bad. Like really bad. It's it's not that bad in Dublin, uh, Michael. But there's yeah, there's snow on the rooftops, there's snow on the the, the roads and everything. It certainly uh, has that Christmassy feel to it. Um, not only the four best teams, I'd say the four best quarterbacks in the NFL at the moment as well have made it to the championship round. And unfortunately for Green Bay, it's not going to be as snow and as cold as they'd like. I think it's going to be more like an October day, um, which uh, I don't think will phase Tom Brady. But certainly some of the Tampa Bay Bucks will be happy. It's not. Uh, Ice bowl redux, to say the least. It's gonna, it's gonna be a hell of a day. Just before we start, we're we're presented by our friends over at Ponda Arena. So welcome to the sixty plus people that are watching us both on Twitter and on Facebook. Jeff Reinbold will be here in about twenty minutes or so once we blabber through our picks, um, which will be interesting. Obviously, a huge, a huge, a huge uh, Sunday ahead. The Bucks the Packers is the first game of five past eight, and then the Bills against the Chiefs is twenty to twelve. So who, who knows what time that game will go on to? But uh, yeah. Obviously, a huge day. Two teams making it to the Super Bowl. Sorry, the big game for legal reasons in two weeks. Uh, before we get to the talking, boys, to tell everybody we have a massive week ahead uh, before the big game and a huge free hour pregame show plan on the Sunday of the big game for legal reasons. And there'll be more information ahead uh, after this week. But let's stick to today's action and let's just jump in. Yeah, let's jump in. Bill's. KC is later on. I've got my timings really well. But the first game tonight, uh, it's the battle of Brady against Rodgers in Green Bay. Column, um, <laughs> incredible matchup here. Brady on the verge of creating history with Tampa Bay, taking him to the Super Bowl in their home stadium, going up against Rodgers. First time, I think, uh, column in his home stadium for an NFC Championship game since 2008 when I was still doing my head levels in school. So, well, Long time ago. <laughs> it's 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 a, it's a while. Um, he, he's obviously something he's wanted because he wants to avenge what uh what, what were very happy memories for for Brian. Um, it's going to be um and obviously an interesting one. Look, all the focus is on Brady and and Rogers. Um, and they they've met three times previously. Brady um leads that. Is there anything Brady doesn't lead in terms of stats? Uh, I think what's an interesting one is um Brady against Mike Petton, who is the uh, defensive coordinator for the Packers because they've met 13 times and Brady is 10 and 3. Uh, and Petton is no slouch. I mean, um he, the last victory came um actually way back a, a decade ago when the Jets beat the Patriots in the playoffs. Yes, that really used to happen in a in a pre-COVID world. Uh, the Jets actually were able to get wins uh, in the playoffs. Um, but Pe- that's an interesting one um, because last year um, the 49ers came up with a, a scheme deliberately to affect Petten because they felt he was so unpredictable and he throws different things at you that they they threw out their game plan completely. And if you remember it, um, Jimmy G, I think he threw eight times in the entire game. They ran, 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 and they ran all over the Packers. Um, I don't expect the, the Bucs to, to do that, given the, the weapons that um, they have at, at their disposal. And I don't buy into the weather. 
I just I don't think it's going to be a factor. These are professional athletes, they're the very top of their game, and it's it's Tom Brady. I mean, look, and it's not it's not an ice bowl type situation. So to me, this is going to be absolutely fascinating because of the the players involved and because of the the coaches involved. Because um, you've got seriously talented coaching staff as well. Um, week six is what everyone, yeah, I suppose, is, is going to look to. And um, nightmare for Rodgers that day. Um, two interceptions. Um, just got, they, they came at him from every which angle. Um, so is that a factor? Obviously, regular season wasn't a factor for the, the Bucks last week when they overcame um, the, the Saints. I think it is um, going to be an interesting one for Devin White as as well because he was such a disruptive force last week. He was everywhere. Um, we know that sometimes players can, um, you know, come through the, the playoffs. We saw it with with Von Miller and and, and the Broncos um, and really take over. Um, Aaron Rod- <laughs> Aaron Rodgers, um, you know, la- last week was able to to shred the a Rams defense that are seriously talented, but I think were um, too focused on Aaron Donald um, and and whether he w- he was fit or not. Um, obviously, the other um, piece for me around this is Antonio Brown is out. I think that is bad news for the Bucs because he has given them another dimension. They've also put him in motion and motion is, is something Brady uses so well. There's the famous uh, get in your spot uh, Julian play that, that sticks out um, as one that, you know, was so brilliant. And you saw the Packers use it to their advantage last week where they had Adams against Ramsey and they completely um, blindsided Ramsey and, and put Adams in motion and got the, the touchdown. So I think Brown being out um, hurts them. So two great teams in what should be an absolutely fascinating matchup. Yeah, Colin, you touched on the fact it's their first championship game since 2008 at home. But the reality is that was actually Brett Favre's last game um, in his career. So Rogers actually wasn't even involved in this one. Sorry, Rogers... Rod, sorry. Sorry, Packers fans. Sorry. sorry. I had to get it in. I had to get it in. <laughs> the fact is um, Brady and, and Rodgers have never played each other in the playoffs. And obviously, for them to have played in the playoffs over the past number of years, it would have had to been in the Super Bowl because um, Brady was within the AFC with the Patriots. But that just shows the pressure now that this game, for me, puts on the on the Packers. They've had four championship games in the last 10 years. They've won one. Um, the other three have been on the road. But there's a lot of rounds that need to be made right, in particular the one in Seattle when the game was there and they had it at their mercy. They were well up and allowed Seattle to creep back into the game and then Bostic, I think that name always sticks out in terms of the onside kick, which was dropped and very much a game that that got away from them. And they should have been back in the Super Bowl before now because, in my opinion, they've had better teams uh, up to now. But this season, they've been very balanced on offense. The defense, which was a question mark last season in terms of managing the run game, has improved significantly. We talked last week it could be exposed in the adverse weather conditions by Akers and the Rams. Run game, which has been quite efficient this year wasn't the case. They managed that well. And I don't look at the Bucks run game in particular as anything too dynamic. Whilst Fournette and Jones have been reasonably good this season, I wouldn't expect the, the Packers to be overly concerned about that. But I'm looking at the notes of week six. I may it was a case of way the game plays, but Mike Evans, for example, on the Bucks offense, he was only targeted once in that game. Now, the game was very much in hand because obviously Rodgers had thrown interceptions. But for the Bucs, for example, to win tonight, they're going to have to get a game out of Evans. Alexander's seen as a shutdown cornerback um, by and large this season. So it'll be interesting how Evans gets on. For me, it's all about the Bucs' defence in this game. They played really well last week. There's a lot of talk about Breeze not having the arm strength. But Kamara, the run game, special teams, they were shaky. The run game was, was moving reasonably well. Saints kind of got away from that in the second half. And they're going to have to stop that tonight because if you look at the uh, Packers' run game, Aaron Jones, Jamal Williams, I'm not sure if AJ Dillon is going to play, but they have, if he does, they have three running backs there that can hold their own and create a kind of running back by committee, put a lot of pressure on them, keep them on the field. And then obviously that opens up, you know, the game plan in terms of, you know, fake handoffs, run pass options and giving the ball to Adams, Tanyan, who's had a great season. That Lazard, like they're stacked. We touched on it last week, whether Ramsey would take out take out Adam, but then 
fortunately for the Packers, they've got a number of different options, and that was the case last week. 190 yards between three different players on the team when Adams is normally the one getting all the yards. He had 66 for a touchdown. Um, it's difficult one for the Bucks whilst they're on a, a great journey, and everybody's talking about that kind of fourth team potentially ever play a Super Bowl and in their own stage. And if any players are going to do it, it's Brady. If I look at the two teams, I see a more balanced Packers team than I do a Bucks team. I thought we were going to give him picks to the end. <laughs> I haven't given a pick yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, looking at as an overall two teams. Yeah, I mean, look, taking up on Brian's point, I I actually think you have to say Green Bay is the most balanced team left in the playoffs. Um, it's not they can do it just with the pass. They can do it with the run. They've got that three-headed monster they demonstrated last week, and Aaron Jones has been dynamic for them in the running game all season long. They have a very solid and efficient defense. It's not a world beater, but equally, I think Tampa's defense can be got at. Um, they are, and they have the capability of locking people down. Green Bay is a complementary defense, and they've got very good complementary special teams. They haven't made too many mistakes in that all season long. You go by old Rich Gosling's uh, Dallas Morning News stats. Um, they're very solid, which is great. The guys have touched on some of the key storylines on this. Like uh, Antonio Brown is out. Brady has been leaning, leaning towards him much more in recent weeks. They've started to build that rapport. So now it's going to be about Tyler Johnson coming in, Scotty Miller coming in on certain plays. They can make plays. These could be some of the unsung heroes that come to the fore. But realistically, for Tampa, you're saying, well, Rob Gronkowski needs to catch an actual pass in the red zone. Here, Brady's tried him multiple times during the playoffs to break that record. They tie with Jerry Rice and Joe Montana, um, and he keeps getting stopped. It's getting a bit predictable there. Chris Goodwin and Mike Evans are going to be absolutely critical. But equally, as Brian touched on, Devin White and Levante David are going to be so, so critical to this. Can they actually stop that Green Bay efficient offense? They did in week six, but week six is a long, long time ago, guys. Um, you know, I mean, if I'm defensive coordinator, very simple rule here. Double team Devontae Adams on every single goddamn play. Um, he's had a season of seasons of of course as has um rogers um but he is the biggest threat but like i say they're balanced they can still beat you on the ground uh and the bucks game yeah brian i totally agree they've been basically two yards and dust on first down most of the times you know so how many times have we seen the bucks on second and eight second and nine uh after a first year you know, first down run for no or limited gain um with all that being said, for me, this really builds up to one man and one man only. And when I think of iconic characters and iconic you know, film stars, I think of Clint Eastwood, I think of the man with no name. And the laconic cowboy in this game who epitomizes Clint Eastwood is very clearly Aaron Rodgers. He has more to prove in these playoffs than any quarterback left in the playoffs. And I would have said before the playoffs, he had more to prove than anyone. And for him, there's very much the good, the bad, and the ugly. There is the good. This Packers team, when we talk about efficiency, they've scored touchdowns on 80% of their trips in the red zone. It's the best ever recorded in the NFL. Their third down percentage in the red zone is 50%. That's up 14 points from what they had last year. He himself, this is the mind-blowing stat, 35 TDs, zero interceptions in the red zone but he's only had 23 incompletions in the red zone. That's how, you know, on point he's been this season. And the defense has stepped up as well. But, you know, that's because of the balance. That's because people have to respect the run game. And Aaron Rodgers is an extremely talented man, extremely talented quarterback who can exploit that. But there's the bat. You know, the Tampa game, obviously, in week six, zero touchdowns and two interceptions as opposed to 48 touchdowns and three interceptions in every other game he played in the regular season. But what I see from that is I don't see this balanced Green Bay team being designed to come back in games. There's only been one game all season they've come back from a deficit at halftime, and that was against the Saints. On top of that, when a team has blitzed them, like Tampa has, like the Vikings did with three touchdowns either side of halftime, like Indy did in the second half of their game, they've gone on to lose those games. So funnily enough, even with a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers, they haven't seemed structured enough to mount a comeback. And that's where we link to the ugly. And the ugly is the playoffs. Because frankly, 
he has he's an amazing quarterback, but there's only two times, there's only two memories really of I I look at Aaron Rodgers really stepped up to the mark outside, obviously, of his fantastic Super Bowl winning performances. Uh performance, sorry, singular. You must remember that. They had a great throw to Cook, obviously, in that Dallas game um, a few years ago. And he had those two amazing kind of semi-Hail Marys to Janice in the game against the Cards. But the thing about both those moments, and they were moments, is obviously that Cook game and against the Cowboys, that's only one of two games where he's led a game-winning drive in the playoffs. Tom Brady has six of them in the Super Bowl alone, right? The game again with Janice and those two Hail Marys, everyone seems to want to say, oh, look at that amazing Hail Mary. They still lost that game. And the quarterback's first job is to win. We had Wade Phillips in a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about my defense. I don't look at the other offense. I don't blame the other unit. My defense has to concede less points than the other side concedes. Yeah, concede less points than the other side concedes. That's that's what he matches up against. And I'm sorry, Packers fans, but Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers offense, don't blame your defense. Don't blame your special teams. Don't blame Brandon Bostick. Have failed to score more points than the other side. You know, Aaron Bostic messed up the, 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 the kick, obviously, in the Seattle game. Aaron Rodgers in the offense only scored 22 points, even with multiple interceptions from Russell Wilson in great field position. Not good enough. And let's take last year's championship game as a prime example on that. Yes, they were blown up. Yes, they were 27-nil down at halftime. But why were they 27-nil down at halftime? 25 yards on a punt, four yards on a punt, Minus 11 yards on a punt. Rogers fumble. Rogers interception. Three and out punt. They were the six drives that Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers put together when it really mattered last year. And unless he bucks up his game, then the Bucks will end up prevailing. The <clears throat> the MVP of the league has to buck up his game. Huh? <laughs> I worry about the rest of us. In the in the playoffs, yeah. Yeah, okay. You know, and I made the point, you know, they've been here before and they haven't made it over the line. Um, quick one. The reason why I'm really focused on the Mike Evans situation is because when I think back and we touched on it, that 2008 championship game and the Giants went in there, they put Al Harris at the time as a great cornerback on practical bar- for us and he, he made it, he embarrassed him throughout the game. And Mike Evans, for me, everybody talked about what a fantastic wide receiver he is. But for me, he's top 10. But for him to be seen as top the likes of Adams and other guys in the, in the league, tonight's the night. He needs to step up. Brown, as you said, is out. And while Scotty Miller and Johnson come in and do a job for you, they need their main wide receiver to stand up in this game. And they need to take ownership of that situation with Alexander and give Brady that outlet, whether it's deep or whether it's 50 and 20 yards in difficult situations. Because I do see a lot of second and longs and third and longs because of this, the run game, which we've discussed. It isn't to the extent. And once they can go for one big deep one like we saw during the season where they went for a 95 yard or a home when he was against the Panthers. They're few and far between and I can see Brady having long toward down situation, which he's going to need Evans to step up. There you go. Um, okay. Thanks, lads. I'm just going to leave it short and simple. I think it's probably the greatest NFC Championship matchup in the last 20 years. I... I find it very hard to pick a winner here. Uh, looking at all four teams, including the Chiefs and the Bills, uh, over t- from 29 to 31 points per game on average for both these teams. The last time the Packers played the Bucks in the playoffs was in 1998. It, it's been that long ago, and I think it's a huge pity that we haven't seen Brady and Rogers go up in the Super Bowl. Um, I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to keep it sweet because I think our guest might be ready now. If he wants to give me the thumbs up, I'll bring him in in a second. But uh, happy days. But uh We'll talk about the picks at the end. I think, you know, there's there's, there's obviously one thing covering Devontae Adams, but Aaron Jones on the run looks phenomenal. The Packers have proved me wrong for the last eight to nine weeks of this season, so I can't go against them today properly. But we'll talk about the Bucs as well, maybe later on, when we get, when we give our picks at the end. Um, I think as well, Gronk is going to have to play a huge point in this game. And, you know, Mike Evans is going to have to take a step up as well. This could be a shootout. You know, forty odd points each. But at that, I tell you what we'll do. While before we look at the next game, we'll get the Sky's opinion from Sky Sports NFL. Jeff Reinbold with his coffee. Jeff, how's it going, man? Good. It's awesome, fellas. It's game day, baby. We are. I, I can't. This next twelve hours is going to be hard to wait for. It is indeed, Jeff. We were literally talking there about Tampa Bay Green Bay. So I tell you what, we'll stay on that there, without giving your pick, because we'll do the picks at the end. What's your thoughts of this matchup today? 
You know, Michael, I went back yesterday and I took out the all 22, the coaches film, because so you can really, really study it and, and you get a much better sense of, you know, strategically where they're at and what they're doing and, you know, how they're playing different things. And I tell you what, it was really interesting watching it, what Todd Bowles did in that game the last time they played. Uh, there was much more um, varied rushes than you normally see from them. Now, they're not afraid to blitz. They, they're one of the higher percentage blitz teams. But a lot of what he did was bring four, but always make sure that one of those four was one of the linebackers. And I looked at the percentage of success on five-man rushes, four-man rushes, and then they did have a few six-man rushes in there. And the five-man rushes where they played zone behind it gave him or gave them the best chance against Rodgers. Uh, I don't think it particularly confused him, but what it did is it caused him delays and he had to hold the ball just a little bit more for a routes to come open. And he has great anticipation of a route coming open. You know, he'll throw the ball before a guy's out of a break. But because of the, some of the zone mixes he was getting in the secondary, he had to hold it a little bit longer and got a little frustrated. You know, in that game, it was a blowout, but really um, – you, you got to almost take 14 points off of it because he, he threw one pick six, which was a bad throw. It was late and, a, and a, the corner stepped in front and took it. And, and then it, they also had another pick that went down to the two yard line. So Tampa got 14 points basically from the defense. And um, I think that uh, when you look at it from that standpoint, the game really wasn't a blowout. And then in the, he, you know, Rodgers didn't really play the whole fourth quarter of that game. So I think that game was a really an anomaly for the Packers. Um, for the for the Bucks, uh, you know, it was they played well, but not, you know, not like they blew the it wasn't the score did not indicate the game, I guess is what I'm trying to say in a long winded way. And um, I think that there's a couple factors that are going to play in this today that obviously weren't there when they played before. Number one is the weather. And you got to understand that, you know, I know Brady has played in cold games because he was in New England. But the way our bodies work is we, we acclimatize to what we're used to, right, or what our body's been in. They have not played a game, fellas, in under 60-degree temperatures all year. Not one. All right? Now, that's the, the weather is supposed to be right about freezing today in Green Bay. So you're talking about, you know, that's, like, that's a huge shift of climate. And you go in, when you play a playoff game, you go in 24 hours. You have to be in the city 24 hours prior to the game for media, you know, for media responsibilities. And so your body, they're, they're not, it's not like they're going in there three days early and they can, their bodies can acclimatize. So for a lot of those guys, the first time they'll really feel that cold is when they go out to warm up before the game. And uh, so I think that's going to be a factor in it, too. You, we know that Green Bay loves to play in the cold. Uh, Roger said that last week in an interview that he prefers the cold. He, you know, he's, it's the wind and the snow that he doesn't like. And my understanding is they're not supposed to be any of that today. So that's, you know, again, a, po a positive for Green Bay. Even though there'll, there'll only be a few thousand fans in the stadium, it's still the mystique of Lambeau Field when you go there. So I think those are factors playing uh, for Green Bay. When I think about the things that concern me for Green Bay, I, I'm worried about their ability to stop the run because Mike Pettin really, really wants to play what, what I call small, where he plays with two down linemen, two tackles, his two outside backers, the Smith you know, as I call them the Smith brothers and not brothers, but, you know, Preston and Zadarius Smith and then one inside linebacker. And then the rest of the rest of it's all DBs and sometimes two inside backers and nickel. But he loves nickel and dime. And I just don't know if they can play that against Tampa Bay because Tampa Bay's front blocked them well last time they played. And Leonard Fournette was not available in that game. Uh, Ronald Jones, to me, is right. He's as as healthy as he's been all year, and he's a huge, huge factor in this. I think that between the two of them, they rushed for over 120 yards last week. Um, I look for that to continue to happen and try and force Mike Pettin to get back into playing more big personnel. Um, you know, because the Bucks, the Bucks, especially with uh, with AB out, 
the Bucks may come in with more two tight end plans than we've seen in the past, where both Brait and Gronkowski are on the field. Because Gronkowski's such a great blocker, he gives you almost like a fullback uh, situation on uh, on the field. So if they go two tight ends with Brait as the second tight end and then play Godwin and Evans at wide receiver, then I really think it's going to be hard, hard, hard for Green Bay to sit in there with all those small, you know, fronts against them. Uh, that's a big one to watch in the game. And now, somebody asked me the other day if I, if I had anything that I could tell them, because I'm a big Bruce Arians fan, I, and I say sometimes you don't have to risk it to get the biscuit, for <laughs> Bruce, because because – Run that football. I mean, run that ball. Pound away. You know, the guy that's been the unsung hero for Tampa Bay through the playoffs has been, to me, is Ryan Jensen. When you watch him play, he is physical. And I mean physical. He set the tone uh, in the in the two previous playoff games, the one against Washington's great front, and then last week against um, New Orleans. I mean, he was nasty. I mean, it, he was – I don't know if he had – Anzalone tried to steal his girlfriend in college or what it was. But it's like he had a it's like he had a personal vendetta against Anzalone. And I mean, he was he really, really was physical and a tone setter. And you need one of those kind of guys up front. And, and I think that's a that's another big key to watch how he does inside, because um, he and Marpet, and they're, they're very, very good inside. So uh, that's what I think. I think the other thing is that's always going to be key whenever you talk about a Tampa Bay team is can they mitigate the problems that they've had with their special teams because they don't particularly play great special teams plays. They're not – they don't cover it very well. We saw, you know, last week against New Orleans, you know, if Harris gets that second punt return for a touchdown, that game may take a completely different turn. So that's another area that – nobody's talking about but you really got to watch that because especially in these kind of games where the where the ball is cold and when the ball gets cold um you know it gets hard and it and it's hard to kick it's hard to kick it straight and it's hard to kick it long so i think the, the special teams is going to be really interesting you know mason crosby's been dealing with the shoulder injury and you say well you know how can that hurt a hurt a kicker it's his shoulder well you know again it's it's all com- you know we're our bodies are like a chain reaction, right? So he's got pain in his shoulder. Obviously, you don't want that to to affect his approach or his ability to, you know, kick the ball accurately and long. So I think those are the key areas there. I think that's going to be a great football game. I think it's going to come down to, a, you know, the last drive of the last quarter. Um, and I think, again, just like I said last week when we talked about Tampa Bay and New Orleans, whoever plays the cleanest game, whoever takes care of the ball best, will, I think, win this football game because both teams are going to score. I think both teams are going to run the ball. I'm interested to see Vita Vea back, if how healthy and what kind of shape he's in for Tampa Bay because if Vea's playing inside, when you get Vea and Indomitian Sue next to one another, then it is really tough to run the ball. Teams are averaging less than three yards a rush when those two guys play together. So that's a big key, too. And those linebackers, whoo. Are they good? I mean, they are at, they are athletic, they are fast, and they play angry. And and again, that's what you'd love to see out of your linebacker. So I, I think again, guys, like I said, it's going to be a right down to the wire, last possession, great football game. And certainly, I think I think Michael, you said it, and I think you said it really well. This is the best two matchups I've seen in the championship round in years. Definitely. Jeff, just a, a quick question for on from that. I mean, the weather of things is going to be about 28, they're predicting. So it's hopefully not ice bowl territory for the, 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 the game because we want to see the quality. But on the running game, you know, last week the Bucks they ran it 35 times for those 127 yards. There was a real commitment to the run. Do you see that's going to be critical for them almost to commit to the run, set up the pass as we often talk about? And just briefly, talking about Jensen and Marpet and how great they've played, but obviously in the Washington game, the Bucks lost uh, Alex Kappa, their right guard, who had been a key part of that interior line. Um, the Saints couldn't exploit it, but do you think that could be a big loss for them going down the stretch, and especially in this game? 
Well, yeah, I think that they'll try and exploit it, you know, and, and it's going to be key to how they match those guys up, right, and uh, where you're going to get your pressure from. The the Really, the the strength of the Packers' pass rush is those two outside backers, and that they're typically matched up against the tackles. Now, I think if you get into third and long situations, and I'm talking about third and seven or better, where the run is really not a factor, then you might see Mike Pettin, you know, if you know Mike's history, he goes all the way back to Rex Ryan and that crew in Baltimore. And, you know, all the exotic stuff that Rob and Wink Martindale and those guys coach, he has all of that in his repertoire. So don't be surprised if you don't see the, you know, the two Smiths on the same side, down over a guard, all kinds of different things to create matchups in the front especially when he wants to play coverage and only rush four. He's got to find a way structurally to get his best pass rusher against those backup offensive linemen and cover down around him. When I say cover down around him, say, for example, I'm the guard and you want to put your best pass rusher on me. Well, if you just do that and, and it's that's all it is, just a four down front, and now you've moved me inside, it's still I'm still good because I can slide the center and we can pinch that off, right? So now I've got help and I'll overset outside knowing that if I'm beat inside, the center will pick it up, right? But when you when you cover me with a great pass rusher and then the tackle's covered and walk a backer up on the center, now that guard has to has to block it one-on-one. -on -one. And that's where I think they can gain, gain an advantage if he's going to be able to do that. That's why you got to get – see, I think – both teams want to stay out of third and seven plus. They want to throw the ball quick, get it out of their hands. Uh, I think Tom will take some shots off play action, especially if they can get the run game going. But I, I'm particularly for Aaron. I think he's going to want to get it out of his hand quickly. Well, yeah. Sorry, going to have to uh, Jeff. Uh, two storylines for me in this game. One of which, from the books' point of view, is uh, is the opportunity to play the Super Bowl in their own stadium and be the first team to have that opportunity and chance. Second one would be Rodgers and the fact it's 10 years since he's been in the Super Bowl. And before you came on, we discussed the three games in which he's lost in that time, three championship games. So the storyline for me would be the pressure that Rodgers, may, he may not show it, but in the back of his mind, he must feel that you know, he's running out of, of chances to finally get back to the Super Bowl. And the pressure tonight is more so on the Packers to win than the Buccaneers. Well, I think it's an interesting scenario for both quarterbacks because, you know, there's only so much sand in the hourglass. And for both of these guys, that hourglass has been turned over long ago. So there's not a lot of <laughs> there's not a lot of sand left. And they know that. They all know that. And for for each of them, they have so much intrinsic things to play for. For example, for Brady, this will now if they if they win and go to the Super Bowl. Even if they don't win the Super Bowl, I, I truly believe this. If they win and go to the Super Bowl, it now eliminates any conjecture that it was he was a system guy and that the only reason he won in New England was because he had Belichick and yada, yada, yada. That story, right? And for Rodgers, it's a lot the same. You know, there's only been one guy in the history of Green Bay. They call it Title Town. And, you know, they've won multiple Super, Super Bowls, but there's only been one guy that's ever won two in the history of that franchise. And that's Bart Starr back on the first two Super Bowls in 60. I think it was 67 and 68 before all you cats were born. So, <laughs> so I, I think it's, it's really interesting. He's playing for his, his legacy, too. Right. And say what you want. But Aaron Rodgers has been carrying around. I'm not going to say a chip, fellas. I'm going to tell you, it's a full-grown boulder on his shoulder since he slid in the draft. And he was the only kid left in that draft room in, you know, for, I guess it was 14 years ago. And this, I think, is in, really important to him. I think he, when they drafted Love in, in the draft and didn't get him a receiver, I, and he threw the, by his own admission, through through the remote at the television, uh, I, I think he's been on a mission since that very day. And you look at his numbers, and that's you know that's what you see now. 
So each of these guys has a ton to play for. Each of these guys is going to feel the sense of urgency that comes with playoff football and the fact that they're both playing for their legacy. Let me tell you something, guys. I haven't been through playoff football in, in the pros a number of times. Every step closer to the championship game, you can take the pressure and you can ratchet it up about 25%. So when you come to the wild card game, yeah, there's pressure because it's the playoffs. And then you go to the divisional round and then you go to the, the championship round to me has always been more pressure filled than the actual final game because you're one of four and, and you want to get to that, that you want that last chance, that chance for 60 more minutes of football. And so this one to me is the big one if for a lot of reasons. I'm definitely pumped here. I tell you what, I feel, I feel like we, I feel Jeff, like we, we could talk about this game that much that you'd miss your, uh, your taxi or, or your drive in the work later on. So we'll, we will swiftly move on to the second game. Before we do, just a reminder for anybody that does, obviously, I'm sure the majority of NFL fans in Ireland, the UK, and Europe, catch up with Jeff on Twitter. But Jeff's live on Tuesday night on Twitter, coffee with coach. He's drinking coffee, and I think we're all drinking coffee now. We're all exhausted. I think we'll all be exhausted tonight as well, Jeff, by that second game. I look forward to seeing you sitting in the studio at uh, 20 to 3 in the morning. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Bills, the Chiefs, I mean, this is this is put up or shut up time, I guess, for both teams. So much talk around the Bills. The Chiefs are trying to run it back. I think we'll go Colm, Brian, Mark, me, very quickly, me, and then we'll go Jeff with a full picture. But Colm, start with yourself, man. Huge game here, huge game. Can the Bills shock? Kansas City, who, you know, a lot of the analysts in, in the States, at least, are predicting that, that they are going to win this game. Well, it's, it is a fascinating game. Um, and I, can, can they do it? Of course they can, um, because the Bills have a, have a great team. And for me, Josh Allen has a touch of the, the John Elways about him, and he's capable of putting that team on his back. He, he, sees, he sees the field differently this year. He has been fantastic. Um, and the other piece about it is the Bills' defense has gotten better as the season has gone on. And they have, last week we were, you know, we were all looking and the weakness was supposed to be the run defense. Well, they showed up big last week and they've been able to, they really confuse the the Ravens, which um, is, is an impressive to, to do in and of itself. So to be able to lean on your defense in that way in the, um, in the playoffs, I think makes a, a, a big difference. But they are up uh, against um, the, the Chiefs. So how, how healthy is Mahomes? Um, there's a difference between being on the field and being fully healthy. I, I go back again to Aaron Donald's last week. Uh, Donald wasn't fit, um, really, and, and that uh, impacted. So um, can Mahomes be Mahomes? If Mahomes is Mahomes, you've got a real issue because nobody is better against the Blitz. There is not a single person in the league. He is just incredible. If you try and Blitz him, he will pick you apart. Um, so that that is interesting for me. But I'm confident in the Bills' ability to come up with a game plan to um, to make it interesting. What what is another factor here is um, that I saw Andy Reid becomes in like a, the the ultimate gambler in in the playoffs. So um, in terms of going for it on fourth down. Um, Andy is um, he middle of the like in, in the guys since 2013 those those guys who've been around for for that time. Um, Andy's middle of the pack. Um, John Harbaugh is actually the goes for it most in the regular season. When you, once you go to the playoffs, Andy goes for for it 57 percent of the time. Um, which is phenomenal, the fact that he is so willing to, to roll the dice on it and tells you the, the confidence that he has in his guys. And when players feel that their coach has their back like that, um, they really, really play for him. So um, Reed's aggressiveness, I think, um, you know, is, is an interesting one. Uh, for me, this game will really come down, like, Look, they're brilliant receivers on on both sides, um, and I, I'm sure um, the other guys will talk about that. 
I think time of possession is going to be key here. Um, the games the Chiefs have lost this season, it's where you can keep their offense uh, off the field. So um, the, the Raiders were really good at that, um, obviously, and Mahomes played that game. So to me, that's what the Bills are really going to need to, to look to do in this game. Well, for me, and I've been discussing it for weeks on end, it's not so much about Mahomes. It's about the Chiefs' defense. And by and large, I saw the stats that they've won something in the region of eight games in a row within six points. And majority of those games, the Chiefs' offense hasn't been going at, I suppose, the levels that we've seen last year. But Steve Spagnolo, defensive coordinator, when it comes to playoff football, he just knows how to get it out of his defense. He did it to Giants in 08. He did it last year with the Chiefs' defence. They weren't fabulous during the season, but come the playoffs last year, and in particular the Super Bowl, when the 49ers potentially had that game there for the taking, it was the Chiefs' defence that kept them in the game. And by and large, over the past month, the Chiefs' defence has really improved. And last week when Mahomes went down of the game, again, the Chiefs' defence stood the test and held the Browns. And for me, again, if you look at week six, albeit the Regular season games aren't the same as the playoffs. It hasn't really discussed too much this week, the fact that they played each other this season. In week six, it was one of the games that was rearranged, played on a, a wet even in in uh, Buffalo Stadium. And the, the, uh, the Chiefs won and held Allen to 122 yards passing. And I see that's where I think, again, it's, it's more so about can the Bills' offense go up and down the field because... Was Mahomes maybe 60-70% fit? I think most fans would take a Mahomes 60-70% fit over their own quarterbacks. So I still think that the Chiefs will do enough to put up enough points. It's whether the, the Bills offense can maintain the consistency we've seen over the past months. And that's to me is where the game is won and lost. Yeah, look, guys, um, first of all, giddy as hell for both these games. I mean, the first game obviously is about two legends making their way through their, you know, the waning years of the line in winter. Um, this game is about legends in the making and making their own, um, you know, creating their own mythology and creating their own legends um, in relation to it. I mean, if you look at the, t the tear that Patrick Mahomes is obviously on at such a young age, um, potential, you know, three AFC championships back to back. He's already won MVP. He's already won Super Bowl MVP. Um, the great Sid Waddell comes to mind when I think, you know, Alexander the Great was 20, 33. He cried tears of salt for there were no worlds left to conquer. Um, Sid Waddell said Eric Bristow was only 27. I'll say Patrick Mahomes is only 25, and he's certainly conquering worlds. But the AFC landscape going forward is what really continues to excite me. This game is Mahomes and Allen. We also have Mayfield, Watson, maybe, Jackson, Herbert, Burrow, Lawrence, Tua, even Donald and Carr in there. So the AFC quarterback regime for the coming years is absolutely stacked. And this, to me, is only going to be one of amazing AFC championship games to come in the future. When it comes to today's game, the biggest gap, actually, when I look at the two teams and how they're structured, see how Clyde Edwards-Hilaire looks like he's coming back and he's going to play today for the Chiefs, which bolsters their run game. But the Bills, frankly, guys, don't have a run game. Singletary's been reasonably ineffective. Zach Moss is injured. Probably their most effective runner that the Chiefs will have to account for at all times is Josh Allen himself. So that disparity is different. And, and the Bills are aware of this. Um, you know, the first half, I think it was the Indy game. They think they only rushed the ball, uh, ran the ball twice in the entirety of that first half. So they are heavily weighted on the pass. But my God, what a season Josh Allen's had, what a season Stefan Diggs has had. They are able to zip up and down the sidelines if needs be. They have absolutely everything in their arsenal to do this. Like Brian, I was going to call out, we, we talked about it last week, seven games in a row, now eight games in a row. The Chiefs have won by less than a touchdown. They're able to grid it out. They are battle-tested, which I think is very, very important at this time of the year. Um, and, you know, maybe that will be a decisive benefit in the end. But look, guys... In many ways, this is, you know, sit back, get the popcorn, enjoy, and look forward to many more to come. I'm going to keep this short this week because Jeff's here. 
Uh, everybody that watches this show knows my opinion on this Buffalo team this year, uh, but also a fantastic year for both Mahomes and Allen. Mahomes has got 38 touchdown passes, uh, 4,700-odd passing yards, where Allen's got, I think, four, four and a half, and 37 touchdown passes. Irrelevant in this game. One thing that stands out for me is this. The Chiefs are going to go up, and even if the Chiefs go up and score a field goal or a touchdown in every possession, and they don't punt it at all in the game, there is one team in the AFC that can give them at least a game, and that is the Buffalo Bills. And if anybody here still doesn't believe in the Buffalo Bills, I would ask them to go and watch the Buffalo Bills hype video with Cal Brown from Good Morning Football. This is a team that's been through decades of hurt, uh, and they finally have a team which can really, honestly, I think, take Kansas City a long way in this game. One thing I'll say, I will say before I bring Jeff on here is this. They don't run the ball that much. Will that be something that they, that they do today with Devin Singletary? I think I think it'll be interesting. I, I, obviously, they run the ball, but they, don't, they they pass the ball. I mean, look at that Ravens game. The amount of times that Josh Allen passed the ball. But I'm not going to give my pick yet. But this is the Chiefs' biggest challenge since the last Super Bowl. This is probably the Chiefs' biggest challenge. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say it too much. This is a very, very tough game for Kansas City. And I think the Kansas City fans deep down know that. But they've got a hell of a team. Jeff, what's your thoughts on this game, man? I think it's going to be an awful game. I may not even watch it. I'm in store. I may just leave the studio. <laughs> no, I tell you, don't worry about me being asleep at three o'clock in the morning because this game is going to rivet you to the TV screen. I mean, I really believe this is a, this is the matchup. Honest to God, guys, could you have asked for for better matchups than these two games? And I think this one is the crown jewel of them all because you know. Obviously, there's the there's the you know the the low hanging fruit storyline about Josh Allen against Patrick Mahomes as Allen caught Mahomes yada yada yada, uh, but there's so much more to this game and and again, watching the all twenty two, again I, I just was absolutely amazed at what I saw. It, it was it was an incredible test of wills for the coaches in the game that they played previously. Now I know there was weather in Buffalo, but I mean, that's every weekend in Buffalo. So, you know, um, what I saw was Leslie Frazier calling defenses that he basically said, here's the box. It's going to be light. We're going to avoid gaps. Andy, you won't run it enough to take advantage, and we're not going to let you throw balls over our head. There is no way that you're going to score fast in the game. And his challenge was, as Clyde Edwards-Hilaire started to rush for, they rushed men. They rushed in three quarters of a game last time, last time they played. They rushed for over 200 yards in three quarters of the game. But it did exactly what Buffalo wanted it to do at that time, which was keep the score to a one score game, keep it close and give us a chance to win it in the fourth quarter. Whether they'll do that again is really interesting to me because Josh Allen, now that was, I think I was in the first, they were still playing baseball is, is how long ago that was. And so his evolution over the last half of the season has been incredible and he's accelerated the learning curve and now it's going to be interesting to see now what buffalo does defensively are they going to be that conservative are they, are they going to say to andy go ahead run it on us again because we don't think you will and will andy stick with the run because you can bet that he came out of that game just emotionally drained because he wasn't able to get the ball up the field. He wasn't able to dial up those big plays that he loves to dial up. The Chiefs play design is as good as any I've ever seen, especially when they start talking about how they create matchups, how they get their best guy against your challenged guy, how they create space for Kelsey underneath. We're gonna we're gonna diagram it today on on the telestration machine before we play. Some of the stuff is just absolutely genius uh, use of personnel. But none of that matters when you play like Buffalo played the last time they played. They played two and three deep. They got out of the box, got tried to get their hands on receivers, never let Hill have free access to the high player. He, they always wanted to reroute him, move him around. Um, if they do that again, then it's going to come down to, is Andy going to be con you know, confident enough in that run game? Because 
who knows how Hilaire is. He's supposed to play, but is he really 100%? If he's not, you know, again, I think they'll still have to run it to win the game. The thing I like about that, if I'm a Chiefs fan, is our offensive line is playing extremely well right now. And, and again, that's a, that's, a team, that's a group of five guys that nobody talks about because they're so overshadowed by all the, you know, all the big plays in that offense. But they've done a great job of protecting Pat, and you know, they've run the ball well. And, and so I think that's going to be a key. Buffalo, on the other hand, we can talk all we want about how they fooled uh, Baltimore. They didn't really fool Baltimore. Their plan, Baltimore's plan was faulty, in my opinion. Because when you look at that game, Baltimore was able to get chunk plays in the run game when they ran between the tackles. Because Buffalo said, Lamar Jackson on the perimeter is not going to beat us. So, that, again, that's, the, that's what Leslie Fla Frazier has done. He's gone out of his way to take away the answer or, or take away your best thing, right? So he said, no Lamar Jackson for big plays in the run game. If you're going to run it, you're going to have to run it, you know, inside the tackles, which is really where you should run it against Buffalo because you got a small Ed Oliver in there. And, uh, you know, they just don't have with Vernon Butler and Ed Oliver, they don't have, you know, big guys inside. And fellas, I love Mike Milano. I mean, I, he's maybe the best cover backer in the league. And I think his matchup with Kelly, uh, with uh, Kelsey today is going to be critical. But Matt Milano weighs 216 pounds, all right, 216. So that's where if you're going to work, that's where you want to work. And when you watched the Buffalo Chiefs game, the last one, that's where, that's where the Chiefs got nine-tenths of their run yardage was between the tackles. So that is a critical thing to watch as we watch the game tonight going in. The other thing is obviously Pat's health. How healthy is he? is he? Is he fit to play? Is he fit to take the ball on the perimeter? Is Andy going to have to protect him with his calls? Because particularly in short yardage, Reed's not afraid to get him out and run the option, run the, you know, run the RPO stuff where he has to handle the ball on occasion and expose him to hits. Now, he may not do that in this game. I think there was a huge um, natural overreaction when you saw the when you saw him get up off the ground and he was like a punch drunk fighter and you go back and you look at the hit what i think what happened was he got hit in the neck and we have all these nerves in our neck and that's really because you didn't see any what you would call there was no whiplash there was no head to the astroturf none of that stuff that would say indicate that it was really a concussion and it's never been diagnosed as a concussion he was in the protocol but it's never been diagnosed that way. And that's, that's a big key because if that's what it was, then I think he'll be much, I think his toe will be a greater challenge than his head because a turf toe is a painful, painful injury and how much he'll be able to move around. That's another thing I want to watch in this. When you look at their ability to stop the chiefs passing game and especially the vertical passing game with Hill. And, and I think Sammy Watkins is going to play in this game and Kelsey and, you know, I mean, it's a track team out there. What he did, what, what Leslie did was, and it, again, you can't see this when you watch the TV copy, but he played a coverage that we call quarter, quarter, half. So you've got two, two players to the one side of the field, the corner and the safety are responsible for a quarter of the field. And then there's another player underneath, two, two players underneath them. Then on the other side, he played half field coverage where the corner, typically it was Josh Norman would play low because Josh isn't. You don't want Josh Norman matched up with, with Tyreek Hill on a vertical. And then he played the other safety, Poyer, on top of it. And then the backer fit underneath. And that's a, that's a great coverage to play against Kansas City, especially when you, keep, when you keep Josh Norman low, where his length and his hands and his physical toughness can really reroute those Kansas City receivers. And then you shove Milano at Kelsey and then play Tredavious White high. So if you've got most of the time when, when he'll hurt you, he hurts you from in the slot or as a single receiver weak, not very much to the, to the wide side of the field, to all the way to the, what we call the Z receiver. So that to me was a great structural move by, um, by Leslie Frazier. And I think that it'll be interesting to see what, um, what 
Kansas City counters with. I will bet you, I will bet you in the game, whether he hits it or doesn't hit it, that once or twice, if they play that coverage again, you're going to see a, a route we call divide, where they where they go up the field. Both guys outside go up the field. One goes inside and takes the safety, and the other one tries to beat the corner over the top, and he just lays it out and lets the guy go run for it. That's the best what we call quarter beater that there is in football, and, I, and I'm sure that they'll dial that up a couple of times trying to get big plays against you know that quarter, quarter, half coverage. Um, I look at the Bills, and I've traded text messages all week with, with uh, Cole Beasley, and I'll tell you what, fellas, he's ready to play. <laughs> I mean, and I'm sure that's indicative of every single guy on that Bills team. They realize, I mean, they, it's, it's like they're so close they can taste it. Right. And they all every single one of them is dialed in. And I mean, seriously dialed in. Now, again, Brian Dable, are you going to wait 27 snaps into the first half before you run the ball for the first time against that Chiefs defense? I don't know, but I, I think they've got to run the football. I've got they've got to at least try and run the football some. And I think Singletary is good enough that they can do that if they get if they, if it gets where it's out of balance and it's all, all pass, 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 pass. Then I think Spags will get after them because they're really good with the blitz game. They understand, you know, matchups They Buffalo has got to get Sorensen one-on-one with one of the receivers that can go vertical. He's the guy you can go after in coverage. He and Matthew are the two guys that are limited in coverage. And what you've seen is that uh, lately in the last, I guess since the Raider game, they don't they, they try hard to keep those guys out of coverage unless they're playing against a, a tight end. Um, interesting on the other side of the thing is Brian Dable and the Bills run more four and five wide receiver sets than anybody in the NFL. So they're going to try like crazy. I think they'll be in, in. I think you'll see very few snaps, maybe ten snaps, 20, 20 snaps most in the game of the Bills with an actual tight end. Now, they may flex him out, but in an actual tight end position, I don't think you'll see that very much at all. I think they'll try and detach everybody and spread Kansas City out. Does Kansas City have enough healthy corners? Is Brashad Breland going to play? Their two backup corners are also questionable for this game. If they're down corners or if in the game, Breland gets another relapse and and can't play, that's going to really, really change the dynamic. Ward, Sneed, Breland, those are all good matchups against Buffalo's receivers. But if you start to lose guys in the secondary and you got to go to putting safeties on, you don't want to get into that game against the Buffalo Bills. Who's going to block Chris Jones? That's going to be an interesting one, too, because every game I watch that guy play, he gives you the kind of pressure that you want, which is that good inside vertical pressure against these quarterbacks. So I think those are the key matchups watching, you know, watching the tape and looking at these teams. It's going to be a great game. I think, you know, I I don't know which one of you guys, I'm sorry, which one of you guys said it, but I thought it was a really great point about Andy's approach once it gets to playoff time. I mean, he ain't scared and, you know, he's going to go out there and they're going to go, they're going to go after you. They're going to go after you, and, and, and they're going to give you formations that you haven't seen, motions that you haven't seen. And that was, again, one of the great things that Leslie did the last time they played because all the motion and the formation changes and Kelsey moving around, all that stuff, when you're playing quarter, quarter, half, none of that stuff matters. None of it matters. Tony Dungy told me one time that playing that coverage is the easiest coverage to play because all you got to do is count to five, right? Because my rule is, Inside of one, inside of two, inside of three, inside of four, outside of five. That's what I, that's my rule. And if I'm my rule is inside of outside of one, then all I got to do is find one guy. And if if he runs over there, I go to the next guy who's the new number one. So it's easy to line up, and you don't ever get caught. You should never get caught out of position and give up a big play. So again, that's what I think Buffalo is going to do, and I think. Kansas City is going to counter it by running the football and by taking shots with, with, with that route I just described to you, the divide route. Jeff, I was just going to say, um, when we talk about the run game and how effective it can be on both sides, um, I don't think the Chiefs 
run game gets the credit it deserves because whilst the focus has been on Hilaire and whether he'll play this week, Williams ran for 78 yards last week. Levium Bell, he's not as effective as the player we all remember from Pittsburgh, but he can still get you the first downs, you know, to maintain long drives. And they have three players there that, in their own rights, could start the game at running back. And then one final point, that fourth down play last week, to kill the game against, against the Browns, when majority of people, including Tony Romo, felt they were just trying to draw them offside. What was more impressive was the body language of the Chiefs players. They were all in sync to make it look like they were literally just trying to run them, uh, get them to jump, which wasn't the case. They obviously were going to run a play. I just found it really, you know, when I went through it during the week and looked at it again, it was more so everybody was lined up perfectly to make it look like they weren't going to run a play. You know, it's a great observation, and I'm going to break that play down today, I think. I think I'm going to have a chance to if, if the, we have enough time on the show. It's hard sometimes because we got trying to get into so many things before the show starts that uh, sometimes we have to dump some of the telestration stuff we want to do. But that play and the designs of the plays that Kansas City uses are incredible. I, and what was – you're right about the body language. That was all rehearsed to make it look – you know, the linemen were all up and all that stuff. And, he, and they fooled Romo, and they also fooled the defense. But there was, there was a couple other things that were even more, to me, incredible. They started that play with the back out of the backfield, which is not unusual. But what they did was, and I, will be, I would be willing to bet you this, that they've got, they had a, they had a um, series of protocols that had to, had to be followed in order to run the play. If the linebacker didn't go out with the back, they just take the time, you know, just take the time off the clock and take a take a uh, time out and punt it, right? But once that linebacker went out with the back, then the quarterback knows I got man to man, and I got Tyree Kill at number three to the front side, and my matchup is my best inside receiver against your third guy, because they went to big personnel, right? Because they they want they had to stop. They had to stop the sneak. So they took a they took a defensive back off the field, put a defensive lineman on the field, Cleveland did. So now it starts to satisfy what you want, the look that you'll run the play against. Okay, then they brought the back back in, and all they did was just run and reach protection, put the back on the edge to, to absolutely protect the quarterback, and it's a throw that any four of us could make. It's about five yards, and you got Tyreek Hill, with all kinds of space around him. And all he did was just jab inside. And the guy, I mean, you got to take the fake, right? Because that guy's so fast. And he goes back out to the flat. And it's just a nice, it's it's a long handoff was all it was. And that was a incredibly designed play. And I'm willing to bet you that if at any time, any of those other things weren't there, if they hadn't satisfied all those requirements, all those protocols to run the play, he'd have just take the time out, and we'll punt it, right? And that, to me, is incredibly good coaching. Fellas, he had a fourth and the same situation earlier in the game and, and went for it in that situation and got it, right? So it's not – I mean, these things don't come as a surprise. They practice this stuff, right? When they have their short yardage fourth and third and, third and fourth situations, you can bet – that they, I mean, they they had Cleveland so well scouted, right? I mean, it was it was amazing. It really was amazing. Jeff, just building on that, because the way in which the the Chiefs, the coaching staff across the the board with the Chiefs is just incredible. Um, and I, I, I preface this by saying I, I really like Josh Allen. I compared him to Elway, which is about the highest compliment I can give him. But against. Against man, he's 25 touchdowns and two interceptions. Against zone, he's 11 touchdowns and eight interceptions. Are there any concerns with given what the Chiefs can do? And I, and I know um, like Honey Badger struggles in coverage, but Honey Badger seems to come out of nowhere to take the ball away, especially in big games. Are there any concerns that you have of what the Chiefs can do to disguise plays um, in this game? Okay, the, the, the one thing that Kansas City does extremely well, and there are a lot of things that they do extremely well on defense, 
But when you're going to see, you're going to watch this happen all day today. You're going to see Honey Badger down low, and then real late, he's going to run to the middle of the field. Or Sorensen's going to be down low, and real late, he's going to run to the middle of the field. They play a coverage called One Rat. That they, and, and they, when they started playing it a year ago, when Spags first came in, he had Matthew High as the free player high, and then the rat was Sorensen. And then he figured out that that's not the best way to do this. Let the honey badger be low and put Sorensen high. And what, when you have the, it's not, it sounds like a zoo here. When you got the honey badger being the rat, right? then you got a great chance because he reads the quarterback's eyes so well. And one of the things that's not there yet or is incomplete in Josh Allen's game right now is his ability to know that it's one rat and now I'm responsible for the rat with my eyes. So, so for example, you've got a, you've got a crosser coming to digs, right? What he has a tendency to do, especially against man, is to hold the ball and look right at digs. Well, Matthew will hide it, and he'll be look like he's a half-field player over there, and then all of a sudden drop in and go steal the ball. He is unbelievable with his anticipation and his instincts about playing the ball. And that coverage would worry me if I'm Buffalo a little bit because if, they, if, if Kansas City can match up one-on-one with those three corners against those three wides, and then you use Matthew as the rat, that, that's going to be scary, I think, a little bit. There's, there's two Broncos fans here that would describe Sorensen as a rat. <laughs> <laughs> I love how it took us an hour and seven minutes to talk about the Broncos. Uh, just before we do the picks, has, has, anybody any, has anybody any final points, or, or are we ready to do the picks, do you think? Ready to do the picks? Yeah, yeah, the only final point is, Michael, can we can we speed up the clocks a little bit today and get to game time there you quick? Go. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. <laughs> right. I tell you what, I will let, let me just because I've, I've got, I, like, I'm not going to lie, boys. I've got a graphic ready to go here, so we'll just make sure we're all in order here. I'm going to go first, you know, because I always go last, unless, you know, obviously the, the guest goes last. But um, I'm taking the Packers in the first game. I think the Packers will be too good overall on the course of four quarters i think they'll put up about 40 45 points whereas tampa bay might struggle uh, at times I, j- I just think rogers will do it i think they're due another trip to the super bowl and look brady's coming back next year anyway i still think it's an incredible achievement to be fair as much as i slate brady because i hate him but I'm, I'm only joking. i think it's an incredible achievement uh, what he's done the packers have made me look stupid so i'm i have to pick the packers today i think it'll be a classic game boys i think it'll be one in the fourth quarter uh, picking the Packers, and secondly, is this is a Bills year. The Bills are going to the Super Bowl, and for me, the Bills are going to win it all. I think the Bills are going to not shock the world tonight. Nobody's given them any respect um, or the respect that they deserve, in my opinion. I think Josh Allen is going to have a hell of a game, and um, I don't think the whole like as as I think Jeff said there as well. This whole concussion thing with Mahomes, like, I'm not going to start talking about there. I think this is going to be a hell of a game. But I I'm just picking the Bills by a touchdown. Uh, Colin, who have you got? Well, I, as we said, these are you could make a case for any of these teams, right? Um, you really, really could. But I think um, the um, for me, right, one transcendent su- sports superstar has six championships, and that is Michael Jordan. And another transcendent sports superstar has six championships, and that is Tom Brady. There's a man who. Tom Brady gets what Tom Brady wants. That's just how the universe is set up. And um, <laughs> a, I, I see he. anyone else, you go into Lambeau, the Mystique, it's Tom Brady. Nothing seems to face him. No matter what you throw at him, he finds a way to come back. He, we talked about this season. Oh, Brady can't throw long. Brady spends the next couple of games showing everybody he, he can throw long. You can get in his face. He is you. You need everything to go right on the day in order to to beat Tom Brady. He's got so many weapons there. He's got that line playing so well. I mean, when when you watch, I, I suppose the after or the he was mic'd up for the Washington game, and it was fascinating to hear that. I just, I you know, I I see 
I see Brady winning in uh, Lambeau to add to the Brady mystique. And uh, he he wants to be, he wants the seventh ring to, to put him ahead of everyone else. And he wants to be the first guy to lead his team out in their home stadium. I think that's enough for Tom Brady to make it happen. The other side is really tough because I really think that the Bills feel like a team of destiny. But they're going up against um, Andy Reid in in absolute his prime. He has got the guys he wants, and Kelsey is having a season that no other tight end has had. Um, he is just an absolute. Brilliant, and I and I worry about how you stop. You you can you can you can scheme and you can come up with plans and, and you can take Hill away, but you I I've I've yet to see anyone really take Kelsey out of the game. I I would love to see the Bills do it. Um, I just think the Chiefs will have enough with their weapons. So for me, it is uh, it's the Bucks and the Chiefs. Brian, who have you got? Um, taking away the Brady and Rogers factor, I look at the two teams and I see a more balanced Green Bay team than I do the Bucs. Um, the Bucs defense has been playing a lot better recently, but they've had some flaws uh, during the season, which I think Rogers can expose. And we all discuss Adams, but for me, you look at the other weapons, the run game, they've got Jones, Williams, Tanya in the tight end has been really good this season. Lazard, the undrafted rookie has stepped up. They have much more weapons on offense. And Brown being out of the game, as you said, has been very effective recently. So for me, Rodgers is going back to the Super Bowl after 10 years. So the Packers in the first game. The second game for me, again, I keep touching on it. It's, the, it's Spags and how he has that Chiefs defense playing. I think they will do enough to hold Josh Allen. I don't believe they'll be able to go up and down the field with Mahomes. And one point on the Mahomes injury last week, which we haven't discussed the turf toe injury. It kind of in a roundabout way may have helped him the fact that he did come out of the game in the third quarter because he would have done more damage to that toe if he had to continue to play. So Jeff has even alluded to the fact, do we really know if it was a concussion? Probably not. And I still think Mahomes will be fit enough to have enough drives to put enough points up. And I just don't see how the Bills will be able to go with them uh, drive for drive. So for me, high scoring game, Chiefs to pull away late in the fourth quarter. Packers Chiefs Super Bowl. Don't think anybody would complain about that that matchup. All right, uh, Tom Brady. Sorry, 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 Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, look, it's it's just like any championship round. It's just a week six matchup reunion of both uh, games, isn't it? That's that's what it is. Um, Column Tom Brady already has more rings than everyone else. He's six to Charles Haley's five. But you know, I'll let you wave. Maybe oh, no, no, no. In, in comparison to Michael, Michael Jordan, was who I was oh, talking in about. To Michael Jordan, that's true. That's true. But obviously, on the NFL field, he's he's there. Look, um, you all know I'm a Patriots fan. I'm a massive Tom Brady fan. I'm not going to lie about it. Um, but you know, Tom Brady's won three Super Bowls since turning 37. We talk about Aaron Rodgers having, you know, on his last chances. Well, look, Aaron Rodgers, look at that record, and maybe you can win a few more Super Bowls as we go along. The Brady Montana parallels we've talked about it before, I think, are compelling. Montana made the championship game, obviously, in his first year in Kansas City, didn't quite make it to the Super Bowl. You could see a similar parallel being experienced with Brady. You know, Brian's joining all the fun talking about the balance. He's absolutely right. Green Bay is a more balanced team. Tampa did have a great win against them in week six, but it is skewed by an outlier game. And what the defense did. Um, I, I don't want to talk about that. Rodgers versus Brady. And in fact, I'm going to say to you, the best parallel I can give you is this. It's from The Princess Bride. And there are classic blunders. One is never start a land war in Asia. Another is never trust the Sicilian when death is on the line. And the third one is never bet against Tom Brady in a championship game. With all that being said, another great film reference, Aaron Rodgers tonight is going to channel his inner Spartacus. He's going to rise up, say, I am Spartacus, and break the bonds of disappointment for Green Bay playoff games. And I can't believe I'm saying these words, but Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers will win tonight and go to Tampa. In the second game, um, for me, look, Josh Allen this year, actually 
thinking back earlier in the season, remember they lost back-to-back -back games against the Titans and then against the Chiefs. And in reflection, you can say, well, one was on a Tuesday night having been rearranged for COVID. The other is against the defending Super Bowl champions. But at the time, it was like, yeah, hot start, lost two games back-to-back, -back. same old Josh Allen, same old Bills, they're going to revert back a bit. And by God, have they dismissed that narrative during the rest of the season. They've got hotter, they've got better, they have performed magnificently. Um, obviously, first AFC Championship game in 25, uh, 25 years for them. Playoff wins, proven their mettle all the way along. However, we've talked about Kelsey, we've talked about Hill. We have not talked about McCall Hardman, Marcus Robinson, Byron Pringle. The problem fundamentally is that this is going to be a road safety authority game in the end of the uh, the end of the night tonight because it's going to prove the point that speed kills and the Kansas City Chiefs for me just have too much speed and too many weapons. Therefore, I have the Chiefs over a very plucky, very capable Bills this later game. Jeff, the seed is yours, my friend. The seed is yours. Men, do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in science? Do you believe that the nature will tell us all we need to know about what goes on in the universe? Do you? Yeah. Okay. I, I do. Well, I'm looking out my window right now, and it is snowing hard in London. And in a snow day, how can you do anything but say it's going to be the Green Bay Packers, man? It's snowing in London. The, the gods have spoken. It's a Packer win. I can't go against it. All right? Now, if <laughs> I just I, – I'm going to tell you something. I, I, these games are going to be so much fun to watch. And all seriousness, I think that um, Green Bay, if they have the staying power, and I think that, you know, you look at them, they, they – almost invariably are ahead of teams early in the game, right? How's Tampa going to react? They were up. They should have been up 14-0 the last time they played early in the game. LaFleur does an amazing job of scripting his first 15. If the Packers jump up on the Bucks again, then it's going to really be an interesting game. If the Packers struggle early, if they, you know, if they're not able to get up on the Bucks and we get to the middle of the second quarter and it's a three-point game or the Bucks are ahead, then I think we got a real interesting game coming. Uh, I'm not sold on Valdez Scandling. I'm not sold on Alan Lazard. I like Tony, I like Tanya, but and I like Aaron Jones. And but you look at like particularly Valdez Scandling. I don't know of a receiver in the NFL right now that's that fights the ball more than he does. All right. And Lazard last week should have had another long touchdown pass that he dropped. When you get to these kind of games and you got a chance to make a play, you've got to make it. And if those guys who are inconsistent catchers can play well today, then I think green Bay gets a huge edge. If they don't, if they're dropping the ball and you know, because to because a drop in a game like this is so critical. Because let's say it's second and six, and you you throw it in route, and the guy drops it. Now you're at third and six. That changes the entire complexion of the drive. So again, while we while I didn't talk about those guys, I think how they play is going to be huge. How I think Scotty Miller on the other side will have a will have a good game. He's a competitor. I mean, he's a guy that does all the dirty work. And I think that, that you, will they miss A.B.? Yeah. But I think Scotty Miller is a much better player than people give him credit for. It's going to be a great game. I think the Packers will win it in the fourth quarter. Um, and, uh, again, I think that we'll all come away and, and talk about this Tuesday on Coffee with the Coach about what an incredible, you know, day of football we saw. I think Kansas City, I, I agree very much uh, with, the, with the consensus that Kansas City's weapons, all that speed. And, you know, again, if they get Sammy back, I think that's going to be incredible. The only team now, again, I, please understand this, why I say this. The team that I want to see win the least is Tampa Bay. And here's the reason why. Not because of, I love Bruce Arians. I'm a Bruce Arians guy, right? I love Todd Bowles. But I've got players that I've coached on the three other teams. 
And one of the greatest joys I've ever had is to watch somebody that you had a part in their development become a world champion. So Tremont Williams, who I coached at Louisiana Tech, is going to be the when he plays in the game for the Packers tomorrow or today, he's going to be the first player in NFL history to ever play for two different teams in the same playoffs. Right. He's got a chance. He's 30. T money is 30. I think he's 36 years old, which is really old for a corner. He's got a chance to go to the Super Bowl, and I'd love to see him have that chance. Uh, Garrick Dieter, receiver for the Chiefs, he's got a chance to go to a second Super Bowl, and he's only been in the league three years. And then you got Cole Beasley on the other side for the Bills, who, again, is just – I love that kid is like he was my own son. And to see him go from being an undrafted free agent and getting hazed at the Cowboys so bad that he left the team – in his rookie training camp and had to be talked into going back to Dallas to now being on the verge, he's a thousand yard receiver and on the verge of going to a Super Bowl. I mean, I'm going to have a lot of emotional times in this game. So, so I, I think Kansas city, frankly, will, will get it done just because I think they're just the best balanced, most explosive team in the tournament. I have to say there, I mean, you're talking three teams there, Jeff, that you've got you know, obviously players that you've coached. So, you know, you're definitely getting to the Super Bowl in one way or another, which is <laughs> which is good in, in that sense. But I have to say, and I'm sure these boys will agree, it's just been um, it's been fantastic to, to you know, obviously to hear your analysis ahead of the games today. And I know you're all obviously live on Sky uh, from 7 p.m. tonight, and it's going to be a hell of a game. And I have tried, lads, to go as much as NFL Network here as I could because Jeff's came on. Uh, and I, it'll be very interesting tomorrow night to see how true these are, boys. Here we go. As you can see, I couldn't get a picture from Mark, so I thought, as he's a Brady fan, boy, what a better time to put that up. Uh, to Packers up. But uh, yeah, yeah. Going. Going. <laughs> Packers, Bills, Collins going, Bucks, Chiefs, Brian with his Giants uh, mug. I think I was out the Seattle game. Packers, Chiefs, Packers, Chiefs for Mark and Packers, Chiefs. I mean, look, it'll be a hell of a Super Bowl regardless. We'll be back tomorrow night, I think at 9 or 10. I don't know. Let, let's see how much sleep we get after tonight. Jeff is on Coffee with Coach Twitter, Tuesday, 8 p.m. And, yeah, Jeff, look, just from all of us, thanks a million. Hope you enjoy tonight. Say hello to Neil and Sean and, and, the, and the rest of the crew for us, yeah? I'll do it, guys. And, and again, just congratulations for what you guys have get, got going over there. This is a fabulous format and a great show and great, great input by everybody, man. I really enjoy talking ball with you. Let's do it again sometime. Appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks, right. Jeff. Aloha. Thank you, Jeff. See you guys. Cheers. See you all later, folks. Have a nice day. All Enjoy right. the game.